day. Welcome back into a special Monday episode of another Carolina podcast, our no huddle edition that we're going to do all uh, football season at least. Uh, that's our plan anyway. I'm Wes Mitchell with Chris Clark. Um, we'll still do our Wednesday shows, which we do from the 107.5 studios, and uh, then we actually are going to do the Monday shows remotely if we can make that work. Um, of course, uh, we'll look ahead a little bit to Missouri, but mainly going to look back on South Carolina's loss to Alabama on uh, Saturday, 47-23. to 23. And, uh, you know, I, I think off top, Chris, uh, you know, first of all, I, I think just a, a game of missed opportunities for South Carolina. You know, the, the score being what it was, obviously, you know, you, you wouldn't say from the final score that it was a close football game, but I think you start to sort of go through the game and the, the sort of games that, that turn the tide, no pun intended, one way or the other. Um, just a lot of big plays that went against South Carolina. Um, and some of it obviously forced by themselves. I'm not sitting here saying that, uh, you know, it, it was all the referee's fault or anything like that. But just one of those games where I'm sure when South Carolina reviewed the film on Sunday, they were kicking themselves uh, at all the missed opportunities that could have made this a much closer football game. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, th- there are a lot of them. And Will Muschamp, you know, said something that I thought was correct and – sort of prophetic um, in in his uh, press conference of Tuesday leading up to this game. And that was that, you know, they're going to be just, just as it is in most games, they're going to be four to six plays. I think he said four or five, but, you know, four or six plays that are going to determine the outcome of the game when it is otherwise, you know, uh, an evenly matched game, especially you, you see that come to fruition. And now some people may hear that and they hear me say, dude, you're absolutely insane. There was nothing evenly matched about this game. Alabama's a way better football team. I will agree with that. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing, Wes, that, you know, I, I go back and look at this game. This is what I wrote in sort of the, the insider report this morning on Gamecock Central. The game wasn't, it wasn't as if South Carolina was overmatched in any area except for one key area, and that was the one in which Alabama made the most hay, and that was their receivers against the Gamecocks back seven. Mm. I mean that that was or there or there you know I mean that was the biggest difference in the football game. You take that out, and yet South Carolina may you know maybe Alabama goes down and, and they they have longer scoring drives instead of big explosive plays. Maybe South Carolina still does what it does in terms of getting into Alabama territory a lot and not coming away with enough points. Alabama probably still wins this game either way. But that was the glaring area. What else was it? I mean, lines of scrimmage, fairly even. If you actually go back and watch the game, mm-hmm. South Carolina offense, they moved the football. You know, but but the difference was, for me, two key things. You know, one big, one big key was play in space. South Carolina failed at that one. And, and I don't think that was a huge surprise. Maybe they failed on a, on a greater level than people anticipated. Um, everybody knew. It, it doesn't matter. You pick your opponent and put it against Alabama. Those receivers and that quarterback, they're going to make plays. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's just no way around it. Um, South Carolina gave up some huge ones um, and in some key situations. And then the other thing was just red zone opportunities. I mean, South Carolina ran the ball. They almost doubled Alabama's rushing yardage. You know, put that in context, Alabama didn't need to run the ball as much. And then they moved the football as well. I mean, with Ryan Polinski throwing over 50 times, they run 89 offensive plays. But to me, um, you know, South Carolina's inability to, you know, convert those opportunities once they got into Alabama territory, you know, into points on a more consistent basis and two turnovers for South Carolina to none for Alabama, th- those are significant. Yeah, you know, like you said, you, you had the key plays, um, you know, and, and from from a big picture standpoint as far as this game, like, like you said, and that's something we talked about all week long. You know, it really wasn't a surprise that South Carolina's uh, secondary, you know, and, you know, as you phrased it, back seven, I, I think you got to include sort of the linebackers in there as well um, as you did because, um, you know, it's, it's a total team effort defending the pass, and, you know, mm-hmm. when, when the ball's getting out as fast as it is with, with these guys, uh, you know, it's hard. It's hard on the defensive line to even make much of an impact uh, as far as that goes. But, you know, to me, I left thinking, um, obviously, South Carolina still has work to do as far as secondary play. Will Muschamp talked about that quite a bit, um, you know, after the game, then on Sunday in his teleconference. Um, you know, there, there's still work to be done. I'm not going to just pass 
you know, pass it off. But, you know, that that's the best group of wide receivers I've ever seen play in that stadium as long as I've been covering South Carolina football as far as just having four guys with, you know, four or five, four four, you know, 40-yard dash guys that are speed, can make plays. Um, you know, Tua is a, a really good quarterback, but uh, to, to me the receivers are, are what just – completely overshadowed yeah. everything else, man. They're, he's getting the ball out quickly. He's putting it accurately. But, you know, they put him in situations to make easy reads. And then, you know, I I don't know how many secondaries in the country um, really could have fit, could have defended that group yesterday. I, obviously, South Carolina has got to do a better job in a lot of areas there. But um, it, that shit was just a terrible matchup for them. And we talked about that before, you know, ha- having to get out there and try to make tackles in space and, um, you know, I have concerns, obviously, uh, about the safeties, uh, you know, moving forward, as anyone does, I think. But still, you know, that group and, and Alabama is able to, to run a true, you know, four wide offense. And, you know, they're, they're all in on this thing, man. I, I mean, <clears throat> we, we knew Saban was willing to sort of change his offensive philosophy and go throw the football. We saw that last year. But just, you know, watching them in person. I was amazed at how many times, even as the game went along and as they were sort of in control, where where old Alabama at that point is going to say, "Oh yeah, you know we we've thrown the football to get to this point, but now we're going to get the get <laughs> you know we're going to get the ball to our five star running back and just salt this thing away." They're still out there throwing it around because that's that's what they have to do right now, I think. And um, you know, you look at the the rushing. You know, South Carolina averaged four point seven yards a carry. Alabama averaged three yards a carry. You know, I mean, they they weren't able to control the line of scrimmage up front as far as the running game goes. So they were sort of forced to throw it, and and they just have the dudes to do it. And I think that's where some of your depth, um, the lack of depth for South Carolina comes into play because we haven't really seen South Carolina have the the guys that are ready, enough guys that are ready in the secondary to to play a true dime defense. You know, I, I think I'm I think I saw it on a third and long. Um, you know, where they had a, an extra DB in the game from their, you know, added to their nickel package to, to make a true dime package. But, um, you know, they, they really don't have enough guys they trust right now, I think, at defensive back just to actually try to match up with a four wide set and, and see, you know, sort of see if, if they could still stop the run doing it that way. So I just think that was a bad matchup for them. Uh, clearly, they got to get better in the secondary. But, you know, other than maybe, other than maybe Clemson, um, they're not going to see what they saw the rest of the year, I, I think. So that, that's something where I think with with improvement from South Carolina's guys and a little bit better matchup, um, certainly from a South Carolina fan perspective, you know, they're they're hoping that uh, it, it looks a little bit different moving forward as far as other teams passing games against South Carolina. Yeah, and and you mentioned the rush yardage um, averages. I mean, on the flip side of that, go look at – what Alabama did versus South Carolina. South Carolina's passing game, you know, you look at it, it's pretty good. Um, mm-hmm. It's pretty good during the game. Really, there was a lot of good with the offense, except, you know, seven trips inside pretty deep in Alabama territory, and you only come away with points five times, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and so that was the biggest difference. But you look at what Alabama did, 31 for 39 in the passing game, 12.7 yards a pass. South Carolina had 5.7 yards a pass. So, um, now, you look at those yards, you say, wow, Alabama must have been chucking it all over the place. No, they just had a lot of big – you know, Henry Ruggs had an 81-yarder. Devontae Smith had uh, two touchdowns and um, well, well over 100 yards and had a big day, eight catches, I think. It was a lot of short stuff. It was a lot of high-percentage passes. We saw one drive where South Carolina made two to hold the ball. You know, one of them, Javon Kinlaw – well, not one of them, Javon Kinlaw wrecked, wrecked the shop the whole day. Mm-hmm. But – uh you know, one of them, Javon Kinlaw, calls a sack, and another one, they sent a well-timed blitz. And Tua had to hold the ball momentarily, and R.J. Roderick came away with the sack. So, other than that, you know, they got they either got the ball out quickly or had time. They were able to find people on, on slants, and, and South Carolina from there, you know, just wasn't able to get the guys on the ground on a consistent basis. But that that's the equalizer uh, for Alabama if you take away some other things. I mean, they didn't play maybe their best defensively. Um, I, I still think they have, even though they got a lot of elite players. They're still right now not a great defensive team, 
You know, mm-hmm. their offensive line hasn't been dominant this season. Um, it, it is alarming when you hear Will Muschamp, you know, after the game, well, you know, our plan was you got to make Alabama run the ball. Goodness. I mean, in the past, <laughs> you already covered it. I mean, making Alabama run the football sounds like a disaster because they've always traditionally been so good at it. But now it's flipped to where if, if you're letting them pass it all over you, it's curtains, you know. And so, yeah, um, those guys, I mean, you're right. It's a great collection of receivers. Before the season, we did a series for our Gamecocks Today newsletter where, you know, top five players by position that South Carolina was going to face. So f- out of five receivers, two teams had all five. It was Alabama and Clemson. And mm-hmm. the guy that I left off was Devontae Smith, who had the best day out of anybody. You know, Jerry Judy, Wes, had – South Carolina did a pretty good job on him overall. He uh, he had six catches. But all – but, you know, five of those were after Alabama had the game in hand, 34 to 13, I think. He only had one catch in the early going. It was the other guys that really – really tuned them up, and it just goes to show the amount of playmakers that they just have all over the place. Yeah, well, dude, if you're not, um, you know, not watching the game on TV, watching the game in the stadium, you know, without an announcer calling out the names, and from my view, I, there were times when I uh, I didn't know which of their guys was catching the ball. Like they, they, almost <laughs> yeah. all, they almost all just blended together because yeah. I'm like, okay, that was just one of the four super studs Yeah, that, you know, because they – they all are, you know, they don't really – they're not really like – there's fairly similarly sized. They're all fast as they can be. Um, they all can make plays, and they just go spread them out. And if you cover three of them, one of them's open. Like, it's uh, yeah, it's crazy, man. They're, they're really, really good. Um, all right, so I, I feel like after that, the, the, the next big story, either the, the big penalties and the, and the big missed opportunities – or, or Ryan Helensky, so we can sort of go one or two ways there. I, I think that's the, – of, of the stuff that happened in the game, what we've already talked about plus those two things probably stand out the most to me. So we'll go to just missed opportunities. You know, you look the, – the fake field goal, um, mm-hmm. which was uh, – turned out to be a great call by Will Muschamp. And, you know, for everyone, you know, myself included, I'll, I'll include myself in there who is – sort of question some of the con- conservativeness and stuff like that. Um, you know, being aggressive, knowing that this is a game you're going to have to sort of steal some plays, um, you know, saying, hey, it, it, we're going to throw it out there and see what happens, throw the kitchen sink at them. You love to see it from that standpoint. Um, the players execute it. I won't say to perfection, but they get the job done. That's called back by a hold. Um, Chris, I texted a few different high school coaches I know and said, all right, take, you know, a lot of them, you know, they're Carolina fans. I said, take your garnet glasses off. Give me your coach perspective. It, is that a hold or not? And um, I got everything from no to <laughs> to that stuff happens on every play to maybe by the absolute letter of the law, it's a hold, but you rarely would see it called to – uh, one person saying, yes, it, it was a hold, um, but the guy probably didn't have to hold him. Um, so you have that play. You have the uh, the call on the punt that was downed uh, inside the, the three, I, I think. They ended up um, – w- was that called an illegal formation or an illegal shift? I can't remember the exact terminology. Do you know? I want to say it was shift, but I could be wrong. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I'm still working through my replay of the game, um, to be honest. I haven't – actually seen that other than seeing it in the stadium um but that that play was huge too because that ends up being um you know Alabama taking the ball at the 35 as opposed to inside the five um that was a touchdown drive where Alabama went for it on fourth and three I believe so you had that play um obviously you have the big play down that's not reviewed where it looks like Rico Daddle could or could not have gotten in uh, you know whether his knee was down or not I think you at least have to look at that play. And then the, the thing about that that I thought was most just uh, hurtful for South Carolina, Chris, is that not not necessarily whether the review would have said he was in or not. I don't know that they could have overturned it. But I just think having a chance to reset there mm-hmm. while they're looking at it as opposed to, oh, shoot, the clock is running. we got to get up there. Um, what's happening? Then they run a pass play from the one. It's incomplete. 
Then you have the fumble right after that. They did call a timeout in between there, um, in between the pass play and the, the fumble. But I, I feel like just a chance to regroup maybe help South Carolina get in the end zone there. Um, so, so that was hurtful, obviously. And, and you look at those plays, all that sort of went against South Carolina. Again, not saying that they didn't have any fault in those, but if those plays go differently, those are sort of the plays to me that stand out in that, you know, that group of plays you're talking about where, um, you know, five, six plays that, that could have changed the, changed the game completely. Sure. And Will Muschamp said, you know, at the press conference, or he actually said Sunday night, um, at his teleconference said, look, you know, retrospect, take the points there. You'd be down 11. I think he, he referenced it, you know, in the, even in the post game too, said, hey, maybe you do that. And I think as he continued reviewing Sunday night, came to the conclusion, hey, we should take the points there. You go down 11, you get the ball back, you go see what happens. But really, you know, I know that's the conclusion he came to. I think you need a touchdown there still. I mean, still. Of course, three is better than zero. That's obvious. But in this game where Alabama, you know, you haven't had a ton of success stopping them. You, you can't come away empty-handed. You got to turn – uh, any opportunity, especially when you're at the one yard line, you got to turn that mm-hmm. into, into six or seven. Yeah, I mean, you got to. Yeah, and so, you know, e- even though Muschamp said, "Hey, we should take the points there, play it safe." Look, you're at the one yard line. Uh, you move the ball. You're going to have three cracks at it if things slow down. And so, that was unfortunate that it happened. I mean, you know, if if Rico you know, just gets in. We're not even talking about it. I mean, it was extremely close, obviously. Um, mm-hmm. And what Muschamp said, he took a lot of heat for what he said initially about the review process. He's actually correct pretty much on on how the SEC structures that. Should the official have have told him, don't bother challenging? No, no. And Muschamp, I think, made his best judgment quickly in that if you if you use a challenge and it's denied, and, and you feel pretty confident that it's, that it's going to be denied, you don't have one later in the game, right? So, um, you know, it, it's just – it's a tough it's a tough deal. Um, that, that was huge. But it, even with all that stuff, if you just execute there, you know, if you get the pass off on second down, if you're able to run the ball on third down, all yeah. those things, then, then you have a touchdown and we're not even talking about it. But, um, yeah. to me – I mean, the key stat of the game, aside from just how successful Alabama was able to be in space, was one that, you know, I mentioned earlier where, you know, you have seven opportunities deep in Alabama, pretty deep in Alabama territory. So, I mean, what what they have is they've got – let me pull up the stat right here. You've got – eight different times actually where South Carolina had the ball on Alabama's side of the field. Seven of them were inside the 31 of Alabama. Mm -hmm. So they had two touchdowns and three field goals. So, and and then they had a turnover on one of them. And one time they got zero points. So, you know, five, two times you're walking away empty handed three times you're coming away with nine instead of 21. So, I mean, that's a pretty big difference. Would Mm -hmm. they have won? If they, you know, had scored twice more and gone seven for seven inside the 31 in some scoring capacity, I don't really know. But those are, it just illustrates, you know, those are the types of plays that you just got to make. You know, the Brian, Brian Edwards got wide open and Holinsky just missed him. You know, that's mm-hmm. a difficult play, but missed him by maybe a couple few yards. You know, those are the types of things that just have to go your way to pull off an upset like this. Yeah, and I uh... – you know, you, you look at those plays, and I, I'm I'm with you. I, I know Muschamp said after the fact, yeah, take the three. But you ain't beating Alabama kicking field goals, right. in my opinion. <laughs> right. And you uh, – did you, you get the ball to start the second half. Mm-hmm. Um, the, pl- the place would have been going insane. Yeah. You know, you have, you have every bit of momentum going into – and I, I, think, I think the entire – and I, I'll give – I think as much as we sometimes will uh, sort of say things about the fans, we we got to give the fans credit. I mean, they showed up Saturday, sure, and they were loud. They were in the game. They stayed in the game. I, I felt, you know, until it was like really completely out of hand. Um, the crowd stayed in it. They were still, at least where I was sitting, they were still being very positive, even you know, with South Carolina down. Um, 
you know, I'll give credit. The fan base showed up. And I, I think everybody, when, when South Carolina went for it and didn't get it, um, everybody sort of had that feeling like it's going to be very hard for South Carolina to win this game after coming up empty from the one. Um, but, dude, if, if they score the touchdown there, then all of a sudden you're coming back out, all the momentum's in your locker room. Everybody in that Carolina locker room is saying, we, you know, we got a chance to win this game. You know, forget keeping it close. Let's go win the game. And um, so I, I love the call. Even though it didn't work out, I love the call. I love the fake field goal. Um, I could have maybe done without the fake punt because I think it was telegraphed a little bit. But um, just the overall mindset of, of it's going to take something extra. You're going to have to steal possessions to, um, to win this game. Um, I, I love that, that approach to the game. Um, I, I did want to ask you, do you do you think they got the holding call correct or no? The, <sighs> On the fake field goal, obviously. It wasn't egregiously bad in the sense that if you go and you look at the rule, you could have called it. You know, yeah. Markway was a little bit – because a lot of people, you think of holding, of okay, this guy's grabbing jersey, like, he, you know, he's – He's pulling a guy from behind. He's tackling him. There's none of that. If you go yeah. by a letter of the law, I can see it. it. It's not we're just. It's not like a pass interference, like the J.C. Horn pass interference, where it's just a it look like a ghost call. I mean, he sort of, I guess, ran into him. But you know, we've literally, like in football in the past, we've seen pass interference calls where literally the guy didn't touch somebody else. I'm not yeah. talking about South Carolina. Just, just any in football, we have seen that. Like, there's literally no hands, and you're just going, what was this guy even looking at? Mm-hmm. You know, there, there was some obstruction that when you look at the letter of the law, and I don't have the, the rule in front of me right this moment, but, you know, I went back and looked at it to where you say, okay, you know, if you go back and look at all the angles and you replay it over and over, you can see it. Um, but it is that called often? I really don't think so. Um, mm-hmm. I think – Apparently they said on the you know, you know on the broadcast they had the, the official former official come on and sort of give the explanation of look when you get out on the edge like that when you're not on the lines and it's a little more obvious and you know has more to do with the play you know yeah uh, yeah you know and and that's difficult to swallow because did they did they need that that type of block or to that extent probably not you know mm-hmm. he may not score. He probably still gets the first down if I had to guess. So it, it was difficult. I mean, that, that's a tough deal. It was not an obvious call, but I could see – I guess I'm, I'm talking in circles. I, I guess you could say, yeah, it was a whole – By the letter of the, the, letter letter of the law. law. Yeah, but, man, yeah. If, we, if we call things by the letter of the law all the time, I mean, that would be – Boy, there'd be, be a long, long, boring game. There'd be about 25 to 30 holding penalties a game probably. I mean, yeah. it would be cr- – I mean, on the interior, people are just fighting down there. So, it's, it, I think it was just more of a tough pill to swallow. And it was – it was I, you could definitely call it ticky-tack. There's no doubt about it. Um, there was an Alabama <laughs> in the stands. You know, I, I heard I, – I was just sitting there laughing at it. There was a, a Gamecock fan in my vicinity asked an Alabama fan, said, all right, what do you think was that holding – and an Alabama fan goes, yeah, he pulled him down. And you're sort of going, I don't, I don't know if he pulled him down. <laughs> you know, but he sort of – he got outside the numbers a little bit. And, you know, it was a little bit. Um, yeah. I thought it was – I thought – I don't know if Markway sort of knew, hey, I can get away with this or you're just trying to block, you know, I can't remember who it was, probably some former five-star linebacker um, out there on the edge. Yeah. Typically, yeah. I think you'd get away with it. But, yeah. Which uh, – the uh, – the somewhat crazy thing about this is I'm, I'm looking at the numbers right now. Alabama actually, they had 11 penalties for 92 yeah. yards. Yeah. So, so they're getting called too. South Carolina had just five penalties for 32, but, but could they have been at worst times, you know, yeah. like uh, terribly timed penalties for South Carolina. And once again, you know, I mean, you take the complete air out of that stadium because at the point, I mean, you just scored. You just had a Parker White touchdown. Uh, you know, you know what I mean. Like yeah. to put to put your team very firmly in the game. Like, uh, I mean, you're you're feeling really, really good. Crowd is going insane, and then you just completely take the air. And then that's the thing. At that point, that had a you might as well burn that play. 
You know, like you might as well literally <laughs> take take that out of the playbook yeah. and set it on fire um, outside at the Springs Brooks Plaza because now you, you can't run that play again. You've, you've worked on that play all week long, setting it up for that exact situation, and you get it, and your guys actually execute it, and – it gets taken away from you. I, I think that's probably what burned the most is, you know, they probably had that play ready, set up. It's in the holster. You fire it at the right time. You execute it. And boom, it's, it, it, it's like it never existed. Um, <laughs> all right, let's get to Ryan Helensky. I, I thought the kid, all things considered, man, uh, played great. Uh, you know, Obviously, there's some throws he would want back. Every quarterback can say that. But for a true freshman, second career start, first SEC start, number two team in the country, um, I thought he gave his team a chance. I, I thought the guys played played hard and played well around him on offense, man. I, I think they, they've they sort of bought into this kid. I, I think they've said, hey, we, we know we've got to give it a little extra to help out our freshmen. I, I thought the guys around him played really, really well. Ryan – still, you know, did a good job of getting the football out. You know, there were several times where I, I think there's an Alabama guy who's a half step or a step away from him, and he just gets the ball out of there. Um, no fear. He puts the ball in danger every now and then, which you'll have with a freshman. But I, I just thought the poise, the, the natural leadership, uh, the quick release, it was all on display. Um, you really have to like the future of, of what this offense could be with Ryan Helensky at South Carolina especially, you know, we'll talk, um, you know, some recruiting maybe um, a little bit later on. But if, if they can keep putting guys around Ryan Helensky, you got to like the, the future of this offense. Yeah, he's he's special. I mean, the, I think we've seen it. You know, first first week, you know, you had the uh, it's just Charleston Southern type of thing. But what you look at is you look at, okay, how does he handle himself? If, if he handles himself poorly against Charleston Southern – you know, not not that great of an omen. And this goes for any mm-hmm. player, you know, but especially a quarterback. You know, if he struggled against Charleston Southern, not a good omen. So not only did he have a great game, but, you know, he, he showed all types of different things, whether it was pocket presence, even though he wasn't under duress a lot in that contest. Um, you know, the, the different types of throws he can make, touch, accuracy. You know, he can he can throw it sidearm, moving from his mm-hmm. moving to his left and throw across his body. He can zip it in there on slants, and that continued against Alabama uh, against a, a much much better football team. You're right. I mean, good, pretty good pocket presence. I mean, getting rid of the ball, buying some time here and there. I mean, you, you look at like just some of the throws he made. The one to Shy Smith was it sort of a dangerous pass? Sure, but go, go back and look. I mean, go back and look at a, when elite teams play each other, and typically they have an elite quarterback. The ball's in danger sometimes. Receivers mm-hmm. go and make plays. Um, yeah, you got to trust your guys, and that was—I mean, it was a gr- it was a great throw because it worked. <laughs> you know, yeah, and, oh, yeah, and a great catch. But you know, you look at the ball like late in the game. I mean, the game's out of hand, but the ball to Tavian Feaster. I mean, yeah. where he just yeah. he drops it in. I have I still don't even know how he got it off, but he sort of whips it around a defender who's right in his face and drops it right in. Um, he can he can just make all the throws, and he's unflappable. You know, he's a guy that he's just a different type of kid, and that's what you love to have at quarterback. You know, any when you go back and look at all these great quarterbacks, and I don't know if he'll get there. Obviously, you got to have a great team around the guy, but. Um, you know, you go back and look at them, they all have some special type qualities. And I think I think that's what he has. I think you look at the end of the game when, you know, when they get the late score to Kyle Markway there at the end on another really nice throw, you know, and, and Holinsky and Brian Edwards and, and Markway sort of huddle up and have a little powwow there at the end. I thought, I thought that said a lot, you know, just about yeah. the belief that they have in them and, and sort of the togetherness. I thought, I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, yeah, and um, I, I like your point, man, about the sort of the sidearm throw. He he almost at times, um, and I think you, I think we've seen this with quarterbacks more. It's sort of a newer trend, I think, just sort of the throwing the ball from different arm angles to avoid um, a ball getting batted or you know a guy's in your face. It's almost like a shortstop in baseball, you mm-hmm. know, just being able to to flick the ball and and he, I wouldn't say. 
his feet are always set um, from a traditional standpoint of like, hey, here's exactly how you robotically want your quarterback um, to to. But but it works for him. Like I feel like he he finds his balance. Yeah. Whether it's uh, like he has a nice balance point whether it's traditionally exactly the way it's supposed to look or not is what I'm trying to say. Um, I've been trying to think of comparisons, man. Um, and, again, I think when you start throwing out comparisons to big-name quarterbacks, people say, oh, you know, you're comparing him to an NFL guy or whatever. I'm not saying he's there yet, but I've been trying to think of who who the skill set or at least who the, the style of play matches. Um, on the field – is there anybody, either Carolina quarterback – I know you hate comparisons. That's why I'm putting you on the spot. Um, <laughs> or a current player in the NFL. I mean, dude, I'm thinking the sort of arm slot thing, um, the fact that he sort of extended play – He was, at times, dude, it was like he was sliding to his left, and then it's like, boom, set his feet, fire, and the ball is out. Um, I almost got like a little bit of Aaron Rodgers as far as like the style of play in the pocket, like just flinging the ball out of there, getting it out fast. Now, Aaron Rodgers has a freaking cannon. Uh, Ryan has a strong arm, but uh, I, don't, I don't know about that. But do you, do you have a, a style of play that stands out? As, as we speak about this, there's a telepathic message being sent to some Clemson websites. South Carolina writer compares Ryan <laughs> Halinski to Aaron Rodgers. This, this may be a headline. It's going to be a message board topic. It'll be on Tiger Net. Yeah, it's the definite. It's a whole story out of it. Um, yeah. I mean, I could see, yeah, some some of the buying time and things like that. You know, Helensky, one thing I've noticed so far at least is, and I'm not even saying this is a negative, and I think it'll come with time, is he, he really doesn't look to run almost at all. <laughs> there's there, <laughs> yeah. There's been a couple times where on pa- on passing plays, I mean, where there's been a couple times where if he if he goes around that, that right side, yeah, maybe tucks it, picks up a few. He's not going to run for a touchdown or anything like that, but maybe picks up a few yards and he's, he'll sort of whip it in there. Um, sometimes with success, sometimes not. But um, Ro- Rogers, to me, you know, looks to run a little bit more. I think he mm-hmm. chucks it downfield even more because he can throw it like 700 yards um, on a rope. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm gonna have to go back and. I've been I've been there with you trying to think of some comparisons, but I'm really bad at them and don't like them. Yeah, uh, it's like it's like when somebody uh, asked Nick Saban at a press conference a while back and said, "Coach, I know you don't like comparison questions." He said, "That's right." So don't ask me a comparison question. <laughs> so, so that's gonna be my that's gonna be my line from now on. But no, I can, well, I don't really have a great one right now. He he's he's, yeah. he's pretty unique. With with some of the stuff he does, but man, he's got. I mean, there are a couple balls. I mean, just lasers. I mean, the one to Shy Smith over the middle, a little slant. He put it. I mean, right between the numbers, and Shy's got really good hands, but he he didn't handle it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I, I know one thing, man. This guy's gonna be this guy's gonna be fun to watch. Oh for the yeah, next, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I. Am I getting ahead of myself to say he's going to be fun to watch for these no. three years? <laughs> I mean, no. Oh, yeah, I know what you mean. No, I don't know, man. He's a – who knows? <laughs> you know, I mean, who, who knows? But I I don't know, man. I, I think this guy's got something we maybe haven't seen at that position around here in a while. But we'll see. I, I don't I don't want to get ahead and start putting all – you know, just be that media guy that just starts putting all that pressure on this kid. But, man, um, you got to love what you've seen so far. Um you know, some other guys we got to throw a little bit of love at. I mean, Rico Daddle, man, through three games has been, um, I'll say it, really, really good to great. I mean, he's done what he's hoped to do, which was have his best year as his senior year so far. Um, Tavian Feaster has done a good job of pushing him. You know, I thought I thought both those guys ran really hard yesterday, man, or Saturday, I should say. Um, you know, just pushing the pile, making guys miss. Um you know, you mentioned the play to Tavian in the passing game. Um, you know, that was really good. I, I thought – I actually thought we'd maybe see Tavian a little more in the passing game uh, so far this year. But but those guys have done well. Um, you know, Brian Edwards uh, was playing like a man possessed. Shy Smith had the big catch. Um, Kyle Markway, man. I mean, you know, we talked about the lack of depth at, at tight end coming into the year. But as far as, um, you know, that position goes, Kyle Markway has played outstanding. 
um, you know, and, and been there, has blocked, he's caught. Um, you know, Nick Muse has showed us the athleticism. I, I think obviously he'll want a couple of those drops back. But, yeah. you know, I, I think in time, I, I, I don't know if that's going to really be the issue that it's been early. I think we're talking about a small sample size here. But just athleticism, size, um, ability to actually make some guys miss in, in open space too. Um, you know, if they stay healthy at tight end, you know, they're, they're going to be fine at that position for this year. Um, so all, offense, I, I think, has some things they're working through that, uh, you know, if they can just find that consistency that we've talked about for the last sort of year or so, um, you know, they, they've got a chance. Um, real quick, we talked a bit about the secondary. Um, you know, we'd just be de- beating a dead horse at this point. Um, mm-hmm. But defensive thoughts so far, uh, big picture, Chris. Where where you thought it was going to be, not quite. I, I'll be honest. I I I had really I had high expectations for this defense. Um, I still I I still think, like I said in the open, I think it's a lot. A lot of Saturday had to do with the opponent and being a bad matchup. I'm very very curious to see what this defense. And the offense, too, but just the matchup this week against Missouri, which we'll talk about in our show later this week, um, is going to tell us a lot. But I, I'm very curious. You know, I, the impression you get on the message board is that everybody thinks this defense just is awful at this point. Um, I'm not ready to go that far, but I do think there are some – you know, you, you want to see DJ Wanham start to flash a little bit more moving forward. Um, you want some guys to step up at safety. Um you know, I think Ernest Jones has been a bright spot. Um, you know, I think R.J. Roderick has actually done, you know, done some some good things. He's made some plays, um, you know. But I and I think Javon Kinlaw has actually been really, really good um, overall. But uh, it, better, worse, about what you thought. Where where is it at right now? Not not as good as I anticipated. Um, but I'll be honest, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, not as much to do with the Alabama game at all. Um, yeah. W- were there some things that were not? Good there, sure, sure. Especially in the secondary. I mean, that that was the most disappointing area. Um, I probably, I would say, I didn't expect it to be that poor against Alabama, but I expected Alabama to make a lot of plays um, mm-hmm. and to score a lot of points. Frankly, I mean, I think I picked. I think my pick for the game ended up being forty-five twenty. So mm-hmm. now some of that was colored by South Carolina's defense has not been as good through. You know, really, you don't count Charleston Southern that much. They were dominant in that game, but, you know, it is what it is. You know, I I think, you know, had South Carolina been much better against North Carolina, I don't know if that would have adjusted (laughs) really what I thought about Bama. I mean, I I may maybe, like, if South Carolina would have dominated North Carolina defensively, maybe I picked Bama to score, like, 38. I mean, Mm -hmm. seriously, that's how how good I think they are. So – I would say not as good as expected because of the North Carolina game. Not not as much to do with Alabama. The North Carolina game, South Carolina sort of alternated between really good and really bad, you know. Yeah. And some of the plays were, you know, I mean, dropping an interception, for example, that really could have changed the game. Or And there were a bunch of plays. I, I wasn't a play that lost it. But, I mean, two 90-plus yard drives with some major breakdowns are difficult to swallow. And mm-hmm. that that was the most glaring thing. So, um, I think we'll we'll know more against some more evenly matched opponents. Whether it's you know Missouri, Kentucky, Tennessee, I just don't take you know you don't get too up on the team's performance on, in any phase of the game against Charleston Southern. You don't get too down about it because of, of Alabama. You know, mm-hmm. you look at, I mean, you you look at the amount of points, for example, this team scored last year. And it's a lot of the same guys, right? I mean, it's the same quarterback. It's the same receivers. Here's what they did last year. They scored 45 against A&M, 62 against Ole Miss. They scored 65 against Arkansas, 58 against Tennessee. Yeah, 29 nothing against LSU, 52 against Auburn, 35 against Georgia, you know, 45, 45 against Oklahoma. They only scored 16 against Clemson. That was their worst game for sure. And obviously, that Clemson team was pretty doggone good because they won the national title. But they just they, – they rolled over people. Even teams that um, were certainly better than South Carolina defensively last year and had better defenses than probably that South Carolina projected to have this year in some cases, in some cases not. My point is Alabama is really good. So, I, I don't think you uh, – 
I don't think you, you say, well, South Carolina's defense is just awful because of what mm-hmm. Alabama did. I do think it's very fair to look at it and say that North Carolina performance was sort of disturbing with some of the things that happened. So uh, they got to get that figured out. I think there are some things that they've done better, you know, at times, but also yeah. some things that are still a question. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll see as the year goes on. We're, uh, learn, learn a lot in the next two weeks, man. Um, you know, I, I think uh, Missouri, Kentucky, at this point, no, there are really no excuses that are going to be allowed. I'll, I'll no. say that, you know, fan base wise, media wise, you know, ev- everybody wise, honestly, I mean, they, they need to win these next two games. Like that's really just what it comes down to. You, you know, North Carolina opening game is a terrible loss. We've talked about that. Um, but sometimes terrible losses, sometimes it happens. Um, Charleston Southern did what they were supposed to do. Alabama, you know, that played out the way it was, quote, supposed to play out too, honestly. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, we'll see moving forward. I, I think Ryan Helensky gives them some juice on offense moving forward. Very surprised South Carolina opened as a 10-point underdog. Honestly, I thought that would be about half that maybe. Um, but uh, it's already dropped down a little bit last I checked. But um, – yeah, anyway, real quick, uh, you want to tell them about the Terry Bishop team there, Chris? I know they've sponsored um, all of our football content this year, so and including our podcast. And uh, Terry Bishop, former Gamecock, does a great job and um, has a number of high-profile clients in the Columbia area, has been doing it for a long time. Uh, so uh, you want to tell them about them real quick? Yeah, um, Terry Bishop, former Gamecock quarterback. Uh, 36 years of real estate experience, so he knows the Columbia market. He knows people around Columbia. So if you're looking to buy, sell, invest in real estate, he's a pretty obvious call because he's a Gamecock guy, Gamecock supporter, uh, and he does an outstanding job. I mean, he knows what he's doing. So uh, he's got a cockaboose for sale right now if you're interested, and obviously a number of uh, properties that you can take a look at if you want to invest or buy. If you need to sell your home, uh, give Terry Bishop a call. Uh, you can find him on Facebook at the Terry Bishop team, mm-hmm. uh, tbishop.breg at gmail.com is how you can uh, find him via email. And if you want to call him, it's 803-665-1442. So we appreciate him supporting our content. Yeah, and also I want to thank Slotsky's Deli. Uh, we uh, do our Slotsky's Deli pick em contest every single week, and uh, you can win a free $60 tailgating package. We've already given away a couple of those um, so far this year, and today I'll be uh, going through seeing who had the closest score in the Alabama game, and uh, we'll be sending one of those off as well. So, um, And, uh, you know, me and Chris and, and Pearson eat Slotsky's about every Wednesday. So yeah. um, we'll be checking that out again Wednesday, and uh, that's when we'll have our next show. And, uh, I, I mean, do we hit it all, Chris? Is there is there anything around the SEC that, that caught your attention? I know we, uh, we didn't really give any scores this time. Anything that caught your eye? Well, the most interesting game to me probably was the Florida Kentucky game, you know, mm-hmm. just because of the fact that, uh, you know, that, that's a couple of, I guess, the games that you could call swing games going in for South Carolina. Whether or not you think they'll win or lose, I, I think there's sort of a split in them. Uh, Florida, probably not a top 10 team to me. That's still sort of bewildering a little bit. Um, <laughs> but they lost their starting quarterback, Felipe Franks. Nasty injury. Um, Backup Kyle Trask came in and played very well. Um, so that's been the interesting thing. Three SEC's quarterbacks with Jake Bentley, Terry Wilson of Kentucky, and and now Felipe Franks all out by week three. Um, but the backups playing good football is the interesting thing. I mean, Sawyer Smith for Kentucky's done a pretty good job. Florida mm-hmm. comes back and wins that, that game. Um, so just a lot of intrigue to me around that one and, and an interesting result with Florida coming back 26-21 and winning. Definitely. I want to thank everybody for listening today and listening at all times. I want to remind you to re- to rate, review, and subscribe. Um, you should be able to get this podcast really anywhere that has podcasts. So whether it's Apple Podcasts, uh, I think we're on Google Play now, um, SoundCloud, Spreaker, YouTube. Um, very popular. If, if you like YouTube, you can actually listen to us there too. That's been, a, interestingly, a very popular place for people to listen to the podcast. So uh, for Chris Clark, I'm Wes Mitchell. Um, check out all of our content on GamecockCentral.com. Uh, we didn't hit much recruiting, but we do have some recruiting notes that are on the site right now, including um, a guy that you need to pay attention to this week, uh, I think, that South Carolina has made a big move with. So 
If you're a subscriber, check that out on Gamecock Central. For Chris Clark, I'm Wes Mitchell. We'll talk to you all on Wednesday.